Welcome to the Apollo Education's Career Panel Footprints. Today we'll be introducing you to sneaker industry insiders who will take us behind the scenes and showcase the number of career paths that find their root in sneaker culture. Career panels at the Apollo feature interviews and panel discussions with theater, music, and media industry professionals with a focus on professions behind the scenes in the arts and entertainment industries. Thank you all for being here with us while we bring you the inside scoop on all things sneaker culture straight to your homes. My first sneaker love because it just was a shoe I grew up with, never let go of. I, you know, grew up with it, went through high school wearing Chuck Taylors, um, college, and always the high. And, um, it's just a sneaker that's always made me feel really cool. The first time I liked the sneaker was Air Max 95. Why is it? It's very confident design. 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 It's very First sneaker love would have to be the Air Jordan 8, uh, Bugs Bunny. I Reason being is because that was like the first shoe I ever had. My, my parents bought them for me in, when I was about one or two years old. I was born in 92. I think they came out in 93 after Jordan had won a championship. So um, just the, the hype around it, you know, you, I could feel that at a young age that it was, it was something crazy. But really a special shoe from the storytelling, the way it complemented Jordan's game. Uh, the motifs that were on the shoe. I mean, I paid attention to all of those details. I'm your host, Apollo Young producer, Natalie Hernandez. Let's meet Jeff Henderson, founder of the global creative agency, and them, and our moderator for today's panel. His career has spanned Nike Kids, Tokyo Design Studio, running, sportswear, to Yeezy. And he's here today with us to tell us all about his fascinating career and to introduce us to some of the amazing folks he's met along the way. I run an agency out of New York City, Harlem specifically. We do product creation, we do content creation, we do it all. When I was a teenager in the 80s in Dayton, Ohio, we would always look to kids from NYC for style cues. From music to sneakers, they always had an idea of what was coming first. Cats from Chicago and Detroit would always have something extra, something fly. But the kids with family from New York would always show up with something that felt more refined, more finished. Then we see it on TV and videos. New York was always ahead. When I first started working as a designer at Nike in the 90s, we would always travel to New York to study trends, fashion, and style. Design and marketing teams would always get a hotel in Soho, but we spent half of the day in Harlem, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Queens. Today, those design and marketing teams don't travel as much as they used to because they can scroll through their phones. They get to see what's happening all over the world on the cheap. Their thumbs take them from Oregon, Boston, and Herzog to Shanghai, Lagos, and Miami in the blink of an eye. But they're missing something, the details, the soul, the vibe. So they're looking for creative folks to connect the dots. Creative folks from Tokyo, from Sao Paulo, from Atlanta, from Harlem. When I was 14, it's going into my third year at Magic Johnson's basketball camp. And that was when the first Air Jordan came out. And I remember I rode my bike to the mall. I couldn't even fit the box in my backpack. Um, went to Magic's camp, thought I was gonna be the freshest kid at camp. And probably every third kid had the Jordans on. I remember Magic wasn't too happy about that. These sneaker companies know that you know something they don't. They know that all the design classes in the world and all the websites on the internet can't replace the people that create the culture, that feed the industry. They know they need diversity. They know they need people that look like you, all of you. But you gotta be ready. Thinking like a designer isn't easy. It's not natural. Most people in life wanna be told what to wear. They wanna be told what's cool. It's someone else's job to build the next wave, engineer the next innovation, sell the next hit. If you think someone else will make a better sneaker than you, then you should stop watching now. But if you stay, you're probably interested in thinking like a designer, like a creator. Let's go. My sneaker love story really began when I was in the fifth grade. And it was the first time that I saw the Jordan 10. That's one of the shoes that were really popular in the Jordan line. And that shoe actually has 
as black and white or black and gray stripes kind of going down the tongue. And the first time I saw that shoe on another kid's foot, I just instantly fell in love. And I knew that sneakers weren't just equipment, they're things that you, you know, allowed you to perform better on the court, but they were really a source of, of self-expression. And I, I fell in love then. And that really just kind of kicked off, you know, uh, my, my slew of, of sneaker purchases thereafter. I was lucky enough to get a chance to get the Oregon Duck 3s. Oh man, you gotta say it's like such a meaty tumble leather on it. And it, it, it like the shoe get, gains more character as you wear it and you beat it up. So for me, the, the, the three is always gonna be the best. And on top of that, that was the shoe that saved, you know, the Jordan franchise. If Tinker didn't come around with that after the two, Jordan was out. So could y'all imagine wearing uh, a Converse Jordan or uh, Adidas Jordan? Wouldn't even be the same type of flavor. So for me, threes forever. So why is it so important for you to share your vision of what design looks like to the next generation of young minds? So for me, it starts back in 90, 1996. So when I first wanted to get into design and design shoes, there wasn't really people who looked like me, I think, that could explain to me what it meant to be a designer, where I should go to school, what it is I needed to do in order to be a designer. So once I actually landed at Nike with an engineering degree, I was like a terrible fit. And so what was interesting was I actually went into my boss, I actually took a job doing like blueprints. That was the first job I had at Nike. And after a month, I went to my boss and was like, I'm kind of bored. And he was like, of course you're bored. You have an engineering degree, like go find another job. And so I went around to different people to kind of find out what is it I could do. And one of the things I was like really able to show I could do was design. And so what I ended up doing was sitting by a lot of designers till they taught me how to actually do a little bit of what they did, enough for me to like glom on. But the reality is I wasn't really prepared. I didn't have the prereqs. Like I didn't really fit the description of like what a designer looked like. Uh, I actually write about it like everybody like, and this was Beaverton, Oregon in 1996. And there's a shot uh, that you can find of like all the design team like for Nike. And it was very white, it was very male. And I didn't really fit in. What was great is that there were people who were like, that's an advantage. You can actually bring what you can to the table and do something different. So I was able to sort of figure out what that was, but it wasn't easy. It was like a lot of like kicking over stones to figure out what do I fit in here? What am I supposed to do there? Like what really will work? And because I, I think I had to be comfortable with being like who I was, a lot of people still accepted it, but it wasn't the norm. And so for me, being able to share like with some folks on stage to talk about how their careers sort of formed, how sneakers might be a part of it, no matter what they did. Like, mm -hmm. that to me is important so that the younger version of me out there, like, it could be you, it could be anybody, can kind of see, like, there's not one right way to do things, but there are opportunities that you can take advantage of. So if you want to do sneakers in one way or another, there's a possibility. So how did you discover the world of design and design thinking? So what's wild is like, for me, design thinking really comes back to, and I think I talk about it a lot with people like their origin stories that say in 1998, I'm oh, sorry, 1988, I'm a little older than that. Um, <laughs> I was at home watching BET. I would come home and watch like music videos. And I was sort of struck by this video that was coming on. That was First it was in black and white, then it was acapella. And it was KRS-One and he just starts talking and it was, something that was like grabbing me, but I wasn't focused on the Jeep or his clothes or the song. I was focused on shoes. He had on Jordan 3s. Mm. And so I immediately was like, I have to go get the Jordan 3 because I'd already fought for the Jordan 1. I already fought my parents for the Jordan 2. It's like Jordan 3 was coming. It was like, it's a new one. I need to have it, whatever that meant. And when I actually got it, it had this air bubble on the side. And I didn't know what that air bubble was. And it just kept like, you know, when you're sleeping at night and something's talking to you, like I kept saying that air bubble, there's something in it, but I don't know what it is. So I actually took a needle and I poked a hole in that shoe. And then I put it to my hair and I heard <laughs> And I was like, oh crap, there's something in it. I put a piece of gum in it, stuck it in there. And I'm like, that was like how I saved my shoes. But it was the first time that I realized that this thing that I like bought of the third generation of just something I collected, there was something behind it that was deeper than just what was on the outside. There was actually something, and I didn't know what it was called. I didn't know how to capture that feeling, mm -hmm. but literally something on the inside made me feel like there's something that I could go do or make. And then I realized like, 
the people who make all this, thinking through who needs this, and then ideating and building different versions of something to kind of go, this may not be the right answer, but I have to make something and we'll learn from what that process is. And it doesn't matter whether you do it for designing sneakers or you're making a grocery list or you're making music. All those iterative opportunities give you a chance to kind of see what could be and working with people to kind of figure out what it becomes. And it all came from like me basically stabbing a hole in my shoes, <laughs> letting the air out. What's up? I think the croc is pretty cool just because, you know, rarely in sneakers does a company create a completely new silhouette that initially the consumer is afraid of. And it, and it almost takes, it almost took like a decade or two to get crocs to be like digested by mainstream society. So I kind of respect them as a company because they took a chance with the silhouette instead of just like tweaking existing silhouettes, which is what a lot of brands do these days. And now they have an iconic brand and uh, shoe. My first sneaker moment, I had to be in like sixth grade. I think the infrared sixes came out and like I begged my mother to buy them for me. Um, I think Christmas came around and she ended up buying me a pair and she bought me another pair of dunks that I've never seen before. And I wore those shoes down to the mill and I feel like that was the moment where I fell in love with sneakers. I'm Kiana. I'm one of the co-founders of Incorporated. We're a diversity and inclusion agency that works across all things creative, from speakers to music, fashion, and a little bit in tech as well. So I'm Brittany Edwards. Incorporated is 100% rooted in sneakers. We use sneakers as a foundation for most of our conversations, even though we've, you know, reached into music and technology and like all these different areas and other creative industries. At the end of the day, sneakers is where we got started. So fortunately, before I entered the work world and going into management consulting, I had an opportunity to work at KISS for a couple months. And that was like my first foray to really dive deeper into some of the things that I had grown up really interested in, whether it was sneakers, music, skateboarding even, just like getting back in tune with like the culture that I didn't have access to when I was in school. It was during that time too that Brittany and I founded Incorporated. And that was really the thing that carried me into the creative world. Um, and we're still not done yet, right? Like we will evolve into more and the agency will become more. Um, but it's beautiful to see what we've done in the past four and a half years. I would have to say that my favorite sneaker is probably an Air Force One. I could get one pair of sneakers a year from my parents. Uh, I got Air Forces for the first time in like sixth grade. Um, I had my white shoe cleaner and everything. Um, and in high school, I remember wanting like all the dunks that were all coming out and my parents were like, absolutely not, $100 for a pair of sneakers, you will never. In 2021, in January, Incorporated released a sneaker that we had a group of students design. And honestly, for me, that's my favorite sneaker because of the story behind it. Like when you have the opportunity for kids to show you their thought process behind something, just like their ability to think through something and create something new. So the shoe is built off the concept of defying limits, um, and it was concepted by a group of like 13 to 14 year old students. It's really incredible. Reebok made a shoe for us, for women only. It made the boys jealous. We love this shoe. We played with the laces. We, they changed colors. We matched it to our headbands, to our leotards, to our tights. This shoe is everything. This started my collection. Juego tenis desde los cuatro años. Aquí en Colombia eh, era muy difícil que nos llegaran marcas grandes como Nike, Adidas. Teníamos muy poquito eh, acceso a, a esas marcas. Eh, realmente si uno tenía unos zapatos Nike o Adidas era porque tenías eh, familiares viviendo en Estados Unidos y ellos te los mandaban. Eh, si no era súper complicado. Y un día, de repente, llegué a encordar mi raqueta. Traían, pues, era alguien que traía un par de pares de zapatos de Estados Unidos y los vendía. Y vi unos, si no estoy mal, creo que eran unos Air Max Turbulence. Eran gris oscuros con el talón blanco y tenían el logo de Nike en un verde neón. So let's get started with Tammy Gamble. We're going to talk about deconstruction, the way you take apart product, the way you take apart shoes, and how she learned to just use construction as a way to deconstruct. I am a construction educator. 
I'm also an influencer and a construction trades advocate. You said construction educator. Yes. What is a construction educator? So I actually travel around the world to learn ancient building techniques and I show the evolution of the building techniques within the classroom. So there's a lot of different things that happen and you're able to collide your worlds within this construction realm or pull it apart to do something else that you love. But I also found that when I was a teacher, I was able to connect with my students because I would notice their kids. You know, and, and it was a great motivator when they didn't want to do something because I always had sawdust under my shoes. And I'm like, are you ready? <laughs> I know, do you my, weren't going to step on their shoes. Do my work. You do weren't going to step on their shoes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I mean, we already cut up some shoes, so we already proved that you're yes, dangerous. We All right, everybody, we are at Harlem Grown, getting ready to cut up these sneakers. Right now, I'm gonna lift the guard up as high as it possibly can go because today, I've got some really cool shoes to cut up. So without further ado, here we go. I'm cutting up these sneakers. So I'm listening to the blade because the blade is gonna tell me what it likes and what it doesn't like. You hear it? All right, we're cutting through the shoe. This one's really pretty soft, pretty easy to go through. All right, you hear that? You see what just happened? My shoelaces caused it to bind. I'm gonna pull back just a little bit, adjust it, and what's gonna happen is those shoelaces are gonna pull down. It's binding the blade. I'm gonna go on and pull back, turn it off on this one, take these shoelaces out. I thought they were gonna create a problem, and of course, they did. But so far, we are halfway through the shoe. Let's cut these shoes up. So I'm holding the tongue of the shoe open slightly so that I give the amount of tension I need in order to be able to go through it. Bingo, shoe number one, caught. There we go. Jeff, can you tell us like what's on the inside of these shoes? So you see what's on the inside? This is actually the sole, the EVA. So that's what you step on. You know when you feel it's soft? That's what you feel. Under here, you see rubber? That's the traction part so you don't slide and fall down. And in here, this is actually where your feet feel. So you know when you stick your feet inside shoes and they're like, ooh, you gotta wear socks so it gets smelly? This is the part that catches all the sweat. So you wanna make sure you keep your socks on so it stays clean inside here. And that's the inside of a shoe. Hey, can somebody pick which shoes am I gonna pick, uh, cut up next? My first sneaker love. I think like most people, I grew up definitely a fan of a lot of the Nike Air Maxes, the Jordans, all those releases. But one shoe in particular that really struck me was actually a Reebok. It was the Reebok Instapump Fury running shoe. Actually, I actually have a pair of retros in my office just from the memory of it. Um, at the time, uh, this was like the tail end of of high school, this shoe came out 93, 94-ish. And uh, it, I just love the minimal aspect of the shoe, the Instapump technology, keeping my foot uh, anchored down, the exposed uh, midsole plate out of carbon fiber. I just felt like a superhero. I never felt faster in any trainer at the time than running in this shoe. My first sne sneaker love was the Adidas EQT Breakaway, 1998. Uh, went to a sneaker store. I was in seventh grade looking for shoes for school. Saw this crazy shoe that was just mesh with nylon on top of PU. And I'd never seen anything like it before. At this time, Nike was huge in my city. Everybody was wearing Air Force Ones, Air Max, whatever. And I saw these shoes and I was like, I, I don't even know what to wear with these. Um, got them, thanks to my parents. Wore them to school first day of school. And one of my classmates went to me and said, man, it looks like you're walking on water. Uh, it was that feeling of like, oh, I'm somebody completely different than everybody else. And nobody was wearing this shoe. Nobody even knew where I got it from, even though I got it right in the city where I was from, in Arkansas. It was something that really stood out and it was extremely lightweight. I wasn't an athlete of like running or anything, but it was just a beautiful shoe and I would just put it with anything. It didn't have to match at that time. That's when I really found my own perspective on style and 
wanted to do something different than everybody else. Now let's connect with Chris Emden. We're gonna talk about intention. The idea that things don't just pop up out of the thin air. You have to be ready. You have to have all the intellect and all the knowledge to then enter a moment to then be creative. I'm a physicist, lyricist, fit in this ridiculousness, the witness, the ignorance I dismiss. If Newton's laws of motion were the topic of the course, things are motion, stay emotionless, they hit an unbalanced force. Next up, the second law of situation and summation force equals mass times acceleration. That's the second law Newton foresaw if you want more than the third law is in store. Uh. See, every force has an opposite force, and every action got an equal plus opposite reaction. The sum of all objects at rest is zero, let that object is no longer relaxing. I mean emotion, change in location, till it hits traction, a coefficient of friction. Then it all comes to a full stop, and there went Newton laws over hip hop, but hold up, I'm off Newton. I'm on an Einstein. I like Einstein because Einstein's mind is designed like mine. His formula was E equals MC squared, which is weird because me is your favorite MC squared. Yeah. My name is Christopher Emden. I am a professor of science and education at Teachers College, Columbia University. Author, thinker, writer. I also associate director, Institute for Urban and Minority Education. So, you know we talking sneakers. Yeah. What is your first sneaker moment? Like, go back in time and tell us about when sneakers, you notice it meant something. So I'm in middle school, seventh grade. I went to middle school in Brooklyn, New York. Big, sort of Caribbean influence, Flatbush Avenue, Avenue D. And a lot of Caribbean folks at the time were rocking travel foxes. Like, nice. travel foxes were the sneaker. No doubt. And I just, I just needed a pair of travel foxes because I just needed to feel important. And my mom's would give me bread to go buy kicks, but she always knew I'd get the kicks I needed for school, which was like regular black shoes. And it's like the first time she was like, I'm gonna trust you to get, mo to get money, to go out on your own and buy your school sneakers. And I go down Flatbush Ave, and this one store had like the school shoes and the travel foxes. And I'm like, hmm. You got to have black shoes for school. I'm like, I'm about to buy these white travel foxes with the British flag on the side. I mean, the colors on it and the gold accents. And I remember buying those travel foxes and I was like, I know I'm gonna get a whooping, but I'm gonna be rocking these travel foxes. One of the conversations was about intent and creativity. Creativity doesn't just come out of the blue. You don't just make something up. You kind of have to have a point. You do that in education. Yeah. And so the idea that you can pull these ideas together creatively to then try to get people to learn. I understand to engage with young people, you can't just follow the curriculum. To engage with young people, you just can't follow standards. You've got to throw everything at them. So you got to throw a little bit of humor, a little bit of hip hop, a little bit of high intellect, a little bit of science, a little bit of social studies. Like, you know, I believe in a concept of pedagogical gumbo, which is a teaching and learning that is about taking anything at your disposal to combine together to strike the imagination of young people so that they feel mm. like learning is something they want to be a part of. Mm. My first sneaker love starts with the Nike Hirache, but it continues through an arc of innovation that Nike's brought to the game over the years since its launch. While many people assume comfort is a given with sneakers, I think Nike's done a stellar job at viewing the concept through a new lens with some of their really iconic designs. Uh, the 1991 Nike Hirache started it with the neoprene upper. Uh, then in 2000, they came out with the Nike Presto um, that had a revolutionary sock-like feel. Uh, then they came out with Nike Free. Uh, they combined that eventually with Nike Flyknit. Um, they've really just continued to revolutionize comfort and challenge the status quo with all of these designs. For me, um, it actually was sort of two pivotal moments. The, the first, was I was in elementary school. Um, parents didn't have a lot of money at the time. So while I was wearing, you know, Gary Payton gloves and, um, you know, Reebok answers or Reebok questions actually, um, you know, some of the kids around me had Jordans and, and obviously Jordan, you know, in the mid nineties and, and, and beyond was was the thing to, to, to have or the shoe to have. And I just remember this kid, uh, his parents definitely valued those things um, a lot more than, than mine did. And he came back to back, like or within the same week, um, the, the Chutney Jordan 13 Lowe's um, and the, the low uh, 13, uh, I can't remember the color, but it was a blue colorway. And it was it was that moment when I was like, yo, like not only are these, these tight, like I love the, the mid tops, but it just changed for me um, at that moment. And I really started to, uh, I think, love the sneaker culture more than just the sport of basketball 
and you know some of the products that came out of it. Now let's talk to Ashley Muhammad where we're going to talk about construction. The idea that things are loosely placed around and it's your job to kind of put them together and how you meld them together is very important. Ashley does an amazing job. Let's hear what she has to say. So the beautiful thing about what we're doing today, we are tie dyeing with all natural vegetable dye. Beets, carrots, all the vegetables that we can find. Sustainability aspect is what we really care about, so we wanted to Absolutely. make sure that this was safe for everybody out here playing with the guns. Safe guns, water guns, <laughs> vegetable dye guns. You can 100% try this at home. So please make your own vegetable dyes and try to create something new in your home. I'm the style curator of Harlem Haberdashery. When you meet someone new, what is your process in terms of like how you want to work with them, how you want to create, how do you construct, how you see them being in life the way you do someone who you already know? The hardest part of that is not trying to push your style on to them, but allowing them to still have their sense of style, but just in a more elevated or toned down way. So I think the first step in my process is just learning and hearing about them. What makes them comfortable? What makes them uncomfortable? What makes them feel most beautiful? What makes them feel, uh, you know, not so great? And learning all those things and finding a pocket to kind of stay in those right. guidelines, um, I think that's when it becomes a very beautiful kind of merger of the minds. You mentioned thick skin as a creative sounds like you're a superhero, your origin story about oh, how people you. come at you in a certain way for yeah. things that you're not even comfortable with. Right. But as a creative, it actually prepares you oh, to start putting things in front of people that aren't necessarily the norm. Anytime you put anything out, there's always this sense of, are they going to like it? Or, like, what are they going to say? What will people think? But I think the more you get seasoned in putting out product, you almost kind of, like, who cares kind of thing, right? Yeah. Because where 10 people don't like it, there are 100 people who will, right? right? right there are right. people that are actually craving the ideas that we have inside of our brains. There are people that literally want that. They need to see it for them to create. Like, wow, there's this space now for these things that didn't look like what I was so used to seeing. There's a space for that. Mm -hmm. So there's a 100% way for us to be who we are and comfortable in who, we, who it is that we need to be. A pair of Jordan 9s. Um, in 1993, I was nine years old. Um, I think that's what, third grade, fourth grade around there. Um, after that, that, my love for, I always had a love for Jordan, um, basketball, and that's what really elevated my, you know, my passion into that. First sneaker I fell in love with was the Jumpman Team 2. I remember being like six or seven years old getting that shoe, but what really stood out to me about that product was the huge Jordan branding on the midsole just a statement it created, you know, people knew I had the new J's without really knowing much about the product and just the looks and stuff I got going into class at the time um, was something I would never forget. It started uh, making me look at product differently and started looking at footwear as something as a, as a tool to kind of kind of um, allow you to ex express yourself, you know, have a little bit of self-expression and fun and with style. So um, that product definitely stands out for me. My dad probably had about 10 to 15 pairs of shoes. Ironically, they were all the same style, different colors, but the same style of shoe. And what he would do was send me under the bed to find out, to find the shoe that he was going to wear for the day. At that time, shoes were all the same color. They were a white base or you had a total black body. There were no flood of colors. There were no pastels, nothing. It was white with either a navy or white with, you know, a, um, a red. And what we called them was, oh, navy on white, red on white, maroon on white, green on white. And so he would call for me as a kid, as a toddler, three, four years old. It's kind of how I learned my colors. Hey, Curl, go find me a pair of sneakers. I crawl under the bed, search around because they weren't in order. He just kicked them under the bed, so they were in disarray. And I'd find, you know, I'd pick a shoe based on whatever my favorite color was for the day. The sneakers were different. They were unique. But again, we're talking clean, subtle, simple lines that, again, in 1979, at the then College of the Virgin Islands, now the University of the Virgin Islands, uh, my parents were playing tennis, and my mother was wearing a pair of Adidas Stan Smiths. My father was wearing a pair of Adidas Rod Lavers. But it was the Stan Smith sneakers that stood out to me. I loved them so much. They were just simple, white and green, 
just a little bit, but yet over the top that made you peek, made you pay attention to what they wore. I love those sneakers so much, I actually convinced my mother, uh, who she and I wore the same size at the time, to let me wear them. I love them. She actually gave them to me. Uh, those, I wish to this day I still had them, but I probably beat them really, really badly and didn't take care of them as you know a young kid at that time, not understanding the value of sneakers. But nonetheless, those sneakers changed my life. Those sneakers cast me uh, on, a, on a path to actually document why sneakers are important, not only to me, but also to thousands, if not millions, if not billions of people all over the world. Sneaker culture is alive and very well. At some points in your career, there might be a few, few inflection points where you are usually faced with a critical decision, a, a fork on the road to really make a guttural commitment to transform yourself into the person that you foresee yourself being, sort of that future vision of yourself. And are you prepared to do the work that's necessary to become that person? Is the why. Uh, why are you designing this shoe? What, what's the purpose? What's the goal? What's the end result you're looking for? Are you trying to give somebody an option for date night? Or are you trying to give somebody an option for comfort? Or is it just for your style? Uh, you want to come across in footwear that tells a story of intelligence and grace. Whatever that is, whenever you're designing, always try to find your why you are doing it. And from there, you can never, you'll never fail because you always know why you're there and why you're doing it for what design. The best advice I was given was to think about the future and to gather insights um, and think about how things are evolving in order to create something new. I think a lot of designers and brands make a big mistake of reacting to what's happening now. Uh, but the magic comes from solving problems and it comes from designing innovations for the future. Sbeteno dekigoto dattari, meni mieru mono sbete ga inspiration になると思うので、自分を自分で一番楽しませながら、こう毎日を過ごしてあげるのが。Don't ever put your happiness in a job. You know, don't 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 put everything that you you, you believe that will kind of you know make your life better or or uh, think you'll you, you'll get all your happiness by a role or, or a job that you that, that you have or, or a job that you're doing. You know, six seven years into my my career, um, I, I understand that that this is a job that you should love and you should cherish. You should put your passion into, but don't believe you'll find you know your your, your external happiness in it. You know, coming from the inner city and those kind of things, we put so much um, emphasis on, you know, these products and what they mean to us. But at the end of the day, it is a job that we're filling. Um, you got to make sure that you kind of fulfill those holes or, the, or those, that, that joy, that happiness outside of work uh, with you, you and your family. And, uh, you know, t t cherish those moments, cherish those people. And don't ever believe that a job will kind of fulfill that, that happiness or that void you may have. So I think that was the best advice I ever received. Um, in my career so far. The best advice that I've been given about what I'm doing now uh, would have to be advice from one of my very dear friends and mentors, Cherise Thornhill, industry vet in her own right. Um, and that's to just simply take your seat at the table. I think by doing that, uh, you have, you know, voices such as mine really take up space and rooms uh, where you can make decisions and, you know, really just own your opinion and your thoughts and share those uh, and really ultimately signal to those individuals in those rooms that your voice matters. One of the best pieces of advice I got from Jeff Henderson, um, you know, he, when I started off in my career, he gave me this really great list of the top 20 things I should do in my first year as a footwear designer. So many great things like, you know, draw or, or sketch um, over your, your concepts when they're done repeatedly. Also to, to draw more than anyone else, you know, around me to really ideate five times more because they were more advanced and they would get it right on the first time. But one of the pieces that really kind of hold true with me today is to really create a five-year plan. You know, and that five-year plan, I think, really helps me identify where my passions lie within our industry in terms of education and creating pathways for other designers and other people and women of color who really want to get into our industry. And really charting out that path really, really kind of set me up for, for where I am now and what I'm doing in the Z program. So, you know, goal setting is so important. You know, if you don't have a plan, you have something you want to achieve. If you don't have a plan, it's really just a wish. It's just not an actual goal that you can go after. So I say put a five-year plan together, you know, identify who those people are who can really help you achieve achieve your dreams and, and go from there. The passion is what ignites you. 
So follow your dreams, find your passion, and you'll never work a day in your life. Well, good teaching is freestyling, right? It's being able to be nimble in circumstances that want you to be stoic, mm. right? It's, it's, it's about the nimbleness and the flexibility. And I think that's the essence of freestyle. Like one of the greatest freestyles that I've, that I've ever heard as of recent was, um, was when Black Thought did Funk Master Flex. Mm. And Thought just went off. By the way, the second best freestyle I've ever heard was also on Funk Master Flex and it's by Loader Lux. Um, <laughs> you know, cause I gotta rep Lux all day, every no day. Doubt, and Lux no is gonna doubt, join no us doubt. soon for, no for, for a thing we're doing. But on that Black Thought freestyle, he was going off the head, but there were these moments where you knew that it was prepared. Mm. And so it was like, he would, he would riff off these topics and then you could tell when he's like exhausted the riffing, he'd go back to this one line that you know he wrote. Right, right, right. And I think right. The, the best freestylers are able to go off the cuff, but then always go back to that stable thing that they prepared beforehand. Right. And I think that's good teaching. Good teaching is knowing your content and being so well versed in what you have to teach that you're able to let go and flow. And when you start flowing for too long, you always circle back. And so the art of freestyle is the art of good teaching. And um, Hip Hop Ed, to me, is recognizing that hip hop holds all the magic of good teaching and learning. So my approach for education is really based upon the idea that everything is already inside. So that's how I approach my students. They're already there. I just have to be careful how I chisel around them. Wow. I don't even know what to say on that one. <laughs> like, you're too good for this. There is someone out there who is waiting for what it is that you have in your brain. So don't hold on to it. Release it into the world somehow. I, I, don't, I can't tell you how, but release it some way. Yeah. Whether it's through writing, whether it's through pictures, whether it's through creating a product. Whatever idea it is that you have, there's someone out there that's waiting for it. And there's someone out there that's willing to pay for it. So don't ever also think that it's not a career. The Apollo has had quite an evolution over its 85 years. The doors opened in 1934, and it was one of the few theaters that you could see people of color on the stage as well as in the audience. When you think about the stories and the artists that grace the stage that we're sitting on now, it's immense. Fast forward, as we think about the Apollo today, we are really the only performing arts center in the United States that focuses on the African-American narrative. It's in a big part of our mission, not only to become a home for artists, but also a home for culture and culture building. As we think about the future of the Apollo, we hope to transform and build a new 21st century canon where African-American voices do sit at the center. The range of our work, the theater, the comedy, the dance, the festivals, I think it inspires. <laughs>